Good morning, everybody. This is uh, Jeff Edwards from UW Extension. I'm an extension specialist for the state. Um, welcome to Barnyards and Backyards Live. My co-host today, as uh, always, is Jeremiah Vardaman. Good morning, Jeremiah. Good morning. To your, good to see your smiling face today. You as well. Our guest today is Jenna Meeks. She is from Goshen County Weed and Pest, and she is a uh, assistant supervisor there, correct? Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, we are we are having a little bit of tech technical difficulties today, so I uh, hope everybody bears with us. We'll uh, we'll work through it. Um, I'd also like to mention our technical support person. Her name is uh, Jenny Thompson. You may or may not see her, but you probably will hear her. Um, she is the one who is uh, keeping us straight and keeping us on task and making sure that we. Uh, are able to field questions and those types of things. Uh, just a reminder, if you're new to Zoom, if you uh, use your mouse and go over the surface of the uh, Zoom meeting, you'll see at the bottom a Q&A button or a chat button. If you would like to ask any questions, please use either of those and uh, Jeremiah and I, or I will try to pick those up. Uh, the other way to uh, ask questions is through Facebook Live in the comment section. Um, and if you're uh, watching there, just add a comment. Jenny is watching that and uh, will be um, uh, posing those questions to us. Uh, one thing I'd like to do is shout out to the boys in Brooklyn today. Again, thank you for joining us. And uh, Henry, I hope you're feeling better and uh, heal quickly. So with that, Jeremiah, you always start us off. I know you always have a question for our guest. So, so Jenna, watch out. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. No, thanks, Jeff. Well, great start. Thank you, Jenna, for joining us today. Uh, we're talking about spring weeds, correct? Sure. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's what we'll talk about. Yeah. So, yeah, all, get, all the weeds. The, right. So, uh, we're probably already started into the weed season, if you will. Um, what yep. do, what should landowners and in particular, maybe new landowners, right? Maybe I just recently bought some property here the last few years or, or looking at buying some property this year. What should I first, what should I be knowing about weeds? What should I be looking for on my property? I would say correct identification. Um, so you can look and see all you want, but until you know what that plant is, you don't know if it's a weed or if it's beneficial and the best way to control it. So it doesn't matter if you've been on your property for 30 years or, you know, three days. Um, you need to make sure the identification is correct because you can have new weeds on your property. You know, the wind blows every now and then in Wyoming. So you can't have new weeds. Um, so just keep up on the identification and I'll go through some resources, you know, on how to how to make sure that's accurate and um, kind of some places to maybe avoid or not go and um, some pitfalls there. But I'd say identification is number one, even if you've been on your property, like I said, for a long time. Great. So what about, and I don't want to jump into your presentation too much. So if, if I'm jumping ahead, let me know. Uh, but let's, I, let's define what a weed is and, and maybe define that versus a noxious weed. Okay, yeah, good question. So a weed is any plant that you don't want there. Um, <clears throat> so there is a human connotation to what a weed is, right? So what might be a weed to me isn't a weed maybe to Jeff. So if he has a alfalfa field, but if he had corn in there last year and he has a corn plant pop up, well, that corn plant is now a weed versus, um, you know, in a cornfield, it's probably not your weed. It's your desirable, desirable species, what we usually call them. Um, so when we talk about weeds in Wyoming, um, there are hundreds, um, but we have a noxious weed list, and that is maintained, if you will, by the Wyoming Weed and Pest Council. And every county in Wyoming, so all 23 counties have a weed and pest control district and those districts bring weeds of concern of their area to the council the council then approves 
the weeds that go on that list, um, but then that also has to be approved by the Wyoming Department of Ag. So for a weed to be considered noxious in Wyoming, that would be a legal designation that you are then um, required to have some type of program for that weed. Um, so it's a legal designation within Wyoming. Um, there are other states surrounding us that have noxious weeds as that terminology as well, but then they also have different classifications within their noxious designation. So they might have, you know, priority one or class one or class 2A or some, you know, all those designations. So they do vary a little bit by state. The West in general, I would say, um, maintains a more robust noxious list um, that are legally required to control versus the East. So right now there's 30 noxious weed species in Wyoming and every county then also has the opportunity to declare certain weeds. Um, so there's 30 that are statewide that you're legally required to control. Um, every county then has a separate list that's declared. And so, for example, in Goshen County, we have six species. Three of them are weeds, three of them are pests. Um, so there are counties that have upwards of 40 additional oh, wow. weeds to the state list. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. Um, and some of that is just what the district is, so what the weed and pest district is able to do um, for control of those weeds. A large part of that would be cost share in certain counties, um, certain districts. So, uh, you know, there's different weeds in the eastern part of the state than there are in the western part. So some of them are just a little more noxious um, or a little more invasive in certain environments than they are in other environments. And, and right. Jenna, the, the cost share program is generally for folks who are landowners. We're not talking about folks in town, right? We're, we're talking about more rural uh, applications, that type of thing. Yeah, so you'll learn here shortly that I was um, went to school also for economics because all my answers will start with, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so it depends, Jess. The, there are some municipalities that partner with their weed and pest district and the way the budget kind of works you know is the weed and pest gives 85 percent of their budget or more or less again depending on the county and the municipality if it's their population base and their tax base um, they will give money to municipalities um, and so <clears throat> generally the cost share yes would be for people outside of town but i'm not going to say that's across the board um, true by any means. So if people are interested, they need to really check with their local uh, weed and pest district to see if absolutely. they qualify or not. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Could, before we go on, can you give us a an example of a weed that everybody has a good idea what it might be that is on the state noxious weed list for the whole entire state? <laughs> oh. Um, Putting her on the spot. Not, yeah. not to put you on the spot, Jenna. Uh, <laughs> uh, what, what about Canada? What about Canada thistle? Is that on the noxious? I would think state? Canada thistle would be probably number one. My only hesitation with that is a lot of people call Canada thistle. They call a lot of thistle Canada thistle, and it might not be Canada thistle. So yes, there are multiple thistles on the list. So I'm just going to say thistle in general. Everybody knows, like if it's spiny, <laughs> it's a thistle, right? And that's right. that's what we have. <laughs> well, and the, so. what I think is, why is this list important for us, Jenna? Why why should I care as a resident of Wyoming that we have this list? What uh, does this list do for us? I think Jenny is sharing okay. the state designated noxious weed list, and there's images of them, which is helpful. So, yeah. So we just redid this website um, a couple of years ago, and if you scroll over any of those images, it does kind of give you a little more identification help, and then. <clears throat> you know, some links to some other resources for those weeds. So um, they're important statewide. Um, Wyoming is unique in the sense that we do have a lot of public land. Um, so a lot of these weeds are found on public land and the state in general, I mean, we're all part of the same state. And so there are 
avenues, I guess, that the state doesn't necessarily have that weed and pest can really kind of hone in on and like control some of those weeds so they don't spread off of rangeland or, you know, some forests, things like that into um, private land. Um, in general, the eastern side of the state has more private land, and that's a little bit more important where cost share comes in, you know, that we can mm -hmm. educate and cost share with those private landowners. Um, so Wyoming is very diverse across the state. It's important because as a state, we need to realize that if a certain county has a pool of money from their tax base, but another county might not have as much of a tax base, but that weed is still there, you know, we kind of need to spread spread the wealth a little bit because the weeds don't necessarily go by tax designation either. So <laughs> a state entity and a state list is the best way to prevent the spread overall and to and to have education be consistent throughout the state. Right. So if, if things are on the noxious weed list, it's usually because there's an economic uh, issue related to them. They're highly invasive. They're, uh, they can take yeah. over areas and just become the main plant, right? So that's why we're yeah. trying to, that's why we're trying to manage these things at a level where they're not going to get away and take over. And one right? of the big parts right, of yeah. that that noxious weed list and, and your weed districts and the uh, weed and pest council is one is an avenue stream for the funding and for control of those, those weeds. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Right. And that's a good point, Jeff, you know, there is an economic impact or environmental impact. And so those, those sometimes um, might differ between, you know, interests, but in general, these are all, especially the state noxious list, we are very careful about adding weeds to that and what we think is important as a state, which is why each individual county has the opportunity to declare weeds for their area. Um, for example, Medusa head and Ventanata were found in the northern part of the state. Jeremiah, you're <laughs> shaking your head. So, so I wouldn't be saying yes, I'd be saying no. Sorry to interrupt. It, those, two, always, those two species are, are grasses, correct? Yeah, they are grasses. And so they are a little bit more difficult to control. And so they've really only been found regionally. At first, it was just one county, and now it's three, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe four for one of those species. So as a state, though, we have recognized that if it spreads and it is a, is a high possibility that it can spread faster than what we maybe can, can predict, um, that we don't wanna have to wait in order for that list to come around. So we have listed those across the state. If we find that plant, we have the authority to control it. You know, not, we're not gonna trespass on private land by any means and control it that way, but we need to be proactive in listing those species versus a, a species that might be found in one county and there was one plant um, like yellow star thistle or something like that. So. We do try and maintain that noxious list to a minimum number just because we do like the counties to have their individual, um, you know, a little bit more control over that specifically. But the statewide list, yeah, it's plants that are, that nobody wants anywhere because <laughs> they can what? take over like Delmix and Coast Black. Right. And I think we've kind of jumped ahead a little bit and jumped into the weeds, yeah, sorry. <laughs> just jump full in. Right. But let's back up and right. let's get to your presentation, Jenna, and start with the basics okay. of weed management, uh, identification of weeds, okay. like you said, and, and go from there. Yeah. Sounds good. Is Jenny sharing my screen or am I? I think you are. You are. Okay. I can. <laughs> Nope. Oh. Nope. Click that button. Okay. <clears throat> Does it look like it should, Jeremiah yes. and Jeff? Yep, yes. you're good. Okay. So like I said, we're gonna talk about spring weed control. Um but you know, weeds typically don't know seasons, and so it's important all the time to ask these uh, must ask questions is what I have labeled them. So we'll start there in the bottom left with what is it? And <clears throat> like I already mentioned, identification is probably the most important so you can move forward with um, any type of control method. So 
common question to ask would be, is it a grass or a broadleaf? Because you will need uh, different herbicides uh, depending on that. If it's an annual or perennial, some perennials, say if you want to go the mechanical control route, you really don't want to dig up, like Canada thistle, for example, or bindweed. So knowing what that is in the root structure and how it spreads is important to know if it's an annual or perennial. And again, the time of year. So this uh, this spring, it's been a little bit warm, and so we're seeing some plants really kind of take off a little bit quicker than they have been. So right now, you know, we're seeing plants like dandelions, cheatgrass, curly dock, maybe out in some pastures, those thistle rosettes are getting big. You know, but there's some summer weeds that we don't see quite yet, which would be everybody's favorite, probably puncture vine. Um, so it is important to know what time of year, and if, it, if the seedling looks similar, um, to another plant you might think you have, but you typically don't see that until August and it's only, well, May 1st, you would probably want to re-look at some identification and see what would look similar but be more prevalent in May versus in August. And that'll be important just because, again, herbicides work different if you're going that route or, you know, if you have a new uh, invasive or noxious species that you need to be aware of and tell weed and pest. So, thinking about those questions about what even are we dealing with. Right. So the next, so, uh, hold on, Jenna. Go ahead. So let's kind of yeah. quickly define those. Like how do I determine okay. a grass versus a broadleaf? So a grass will have a blade um, that comes up. I should have maybe brought some, but I, <laughs> I didn't want to bring them into the office, honestly. Most of us it know what a grass is. Their leaves are going yeah. to be a blade fashion. It's going to be a long linear leaf, right? And it's going to have parallel veins. The veins in the leaf are going to parallel each other down the leaf, correct? Yes. And there are some herbicides, there are some grasses that broadleaf herbicides will work for. So again, important to know kind of which, which one that is. And so a broadleaf um, will have, <clears throat> they can also have linear leaves. Um, but they'll typically, the seedlings will have uh, typically two that come out and then, you know, some, like some type of stem or bolt up the middle. Um, and typically taller, I would say, as far as, um, or either taller or bushier than a, than a bunch grass. But broadleafs would have big broad leaves. That's why they're called broadleafs, right? Um, yeah. And they're going to be the, yeah. the forbs dandelions or, or something along that lines could be any, shrubs. Could any be, of the examples right. behind Jeremiah are broad leaves. The, the, <laughs> example behi yeah. the example behind me right now is uh, my favorite, cheat grass. So grasses, broad leaves. Well, and the broad leaves I generally think of as most things that aren't grasses, <laughs> pretty much yes. all in. <laughs> yeah. Jenny, just to come in and clear it up and simplify it for us. That's it. right. Great. Yeah. So let's talk annual perennial real quick. What's the difference? Okay. So an annual, it will only live for one year. Um, I've already mentioned Medusa head and Ventanata, and there are winter annuals, and then you will have spring annuals or summer annuals, but in general, their life cycle is 12 months or less. So if you have a winter annual that germinates in the fall, it will produce seeds uh, sometime, you know, typically towards the end of its life cycle. And then it will, that one plant that already germinated, produced its seed, it will die. So any plant you see after that around it will be likely uh, from seed, will have grown from seed development from that other plant. Whereas so a perennial or even, Sorry? Yep, so, so the annual mainly reproduces and spreads via seeds. Yeah. Okay. Correct. A perennial will live in the same, um, from the same root structure for multiple years. If, you know, two to, two to three if it's a biennial, depending on when it germinates, and then anywhere up to 10 or 15 years for some species like Canada thistle or a leafy spurge. Uh, so, again, important to know, just because those perennial plants, you really need to attack the root system and the 
energy storage of that plant rather than just kind of whack it off the top because it has a lot of energy and a lot of um, good carbohydrates stored in those roots so it can come back to haunt you. <laughs> so one of the main things that we're really trying to do with weed control or weed management is keeping those plants from producing new seeds, correct? Because correct. if they do, then they really can take off and take over. Yeah, there are certain plants where we need to pay special, they might produce seed, um, but where their main spreading structure is coming from or even how they move to different locations can be by root fragments. So that's, yes, yeah, seed is probably the number one priority on a small acreage, but like what we talk about with large landscapes, uh, roots are also very important. Right, great. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so now we got what it is. So what's our next mm -hmm. question? So the next question um, would be, where is it? And I just kind of kept this for, you know, smaller acreage. So is it in your lawn? Is it around your buildings or your sheds? Is it in your driveway? Or is it in your pasture? So there are weeds that prefer disturbed sites. There are weeds that prefer water kind of shaded sites or sunny sites or different types of soil. and so you can kind of start to narrow down what weed it is <laughs> by where it is. And where it is will also impact what type of control methods you can use. So certain herbicides are only labeled for, um, you know, maybe bare ground treatment, or you can only use it in pastures. You can't use it on your lawn in town. And those are all important things to know because, uh, for our safety and for environmental safety, it is not necessarily a great thing to say, oh, well, a pasture and a lawn are the same thing, I'm gonna use the same herbicide. Um, and so we need to be cognizant of that so we can keep using, utilizing these tools. And so they're uh, not maybe kind even, of- Maybe even herbicide. beyond that, Jenna, is just all our control measures, right? So uh, we yeah, might have sure. some control measures uh, and uh, herbicides and chemistry is just a part of those control one of those options but you know in a lawn we might be able to mow but in a pasture right. maybe i don't want to mow because i'm putting up hay and i'm not ready to cut right. that hay yet uh, and so just yeah being able to know where it is and what control options are available to us in that one situation to control that weed in particular i have yeah. one question well, no. well i was going to say tillage is also an important factor when dealing with agronomic weeds especially, but tillage is not an option or fire or, you know, other things like that as far as where is it and kind of what control measures are available. So if herbicide isn't an option and a lot of times it can't be, you know, knowing where it is, if you're going to burn weeds around your house, but your neighbor, you know, might have a haystack or something, you need to be aware of your surroundings. Yeah. So what's your question? So my question is, is there ever a time when I have a weed and maybe I don't need to necessarily control it? <laughs> um, I'm sure the answer is yes. <laughs> but being a person who likes to get rid of weeds, I'm going to say no. <laughs> talk, talk about putting her on the spot, Jeremiah. I think that well, what we worse do. than <laughs> <laughs> so I, all I'm just trying to get at is yeah. that we don't have to kill every weed that's on our piece of property. We really have to identify that weed, know if it's harmful, if I can tolerate or live with that weed, depending on what that weed is, right? I was, so there's, there's definitely a tolerance level. You know, if I see one plant that I walk by every day and I don't want it there, I can sure pull it. Um, but if I don't mind walking by it every day, you know, and it's still a weed, then I'm probably going to leave it there. So, yeah, everybody has a threshold, I guess, of what, of what control measures there are. Um, you know, some people have a lot of weeds and don't control them. So I guess, yeah, that is a situation. <laughs> and it all they, goes into personal perspective, right? Of if I view that sure. as a problem or a weed and if I should control it. So, yeah, great. What's sure. next? Yeah. Okay, so we kind of touched on this a little bit, is how much is there? Um, so if there's, you know, and maybe herbicide isn't the best option, like I said, if there's just one plant and I walk by it every day, 
how hard is it for me to bend down, pull that out? I don't have to go buy product, mix it in my tank, and then spray it, and then clean it, and you know, make sure I wear all my PPE and things like that. So if there's, if there's not a lot, there's different control measures than if there's hundreds or thousands or even hundreds of thousands of acres take cheatgrass, for example. Um, and so those, that can start to help frame what control measure you want to use and, you know, kind of getting the scope of the problem and if it's a short-term problem or if it's a long-term issue that you need to be thinking about and really drive that cost of, of controlling or not controlling weeds. So like we've talked about, a lot of these noxious weeds especially are very invasive. And so the cost of, you know, how much is there this year? Well, maybe there's three plants, but how much will there be in three years? You know, that population can double or triple or, you know, again, depending on your dispersal mechanism of the weed, <clears throat> that cost can, can elevate very quickly. So how much is there is a consideration to think about, especially in your lawn, if you let a dandelion go, you know, one year, how many more are you going to have next year? So that threshold that we just talked about can change very dramatically year to year, again, based on just kind of nature, but also some environmental conditions that we do have or don't have control over. Right. So we have a question, Jenna. Uh, this comes from Facebook okay. with uh, Aaron asks, what about a weed like Russian thistle that will come into a disturbed site for a few years, but it will stabilize the soil until more desirable plants can grow? If it's a disturbed site, I guess I would recommend weed control and seeding appropriate species for that uh, site, you know, if it's forbs or grasses. So Russian thistle is a, is one of the tumbleweeds um, that we see a lot in the West. And so you're not just impacting the ground where it is, might be stabilizing the soil. Um, it typically doesn't have a lot of ground cover. So I'm not very familiar. Maybe Jeremiah and Jeff, you can help me out if that's a stabilizing plant or not. Um, I would say there are species that are suited better to stabilize the soil and Russian thistle, if anything, when it tumbles, it's going to spread that seed further than maybe the Im Im immediately impacted area. And so we need to think of weeds on a landscape scale as well as, you know, what you can control in your disturbed site. I, I think it, I mean, any roots in the soil, anything that we can get there is going to help benefit keeping that soil instead of just keeping it completely bare. Um, it's definitely a weed and a tumbleweed like Jenna has talked about and, and definitely we got to think of that larger impact potential. It uh, depends on where that's at. Uh, I, in my opinion, I guess I'd rank it in terms of severity of the weed. Russian thistle doesn't bother me as much, right? Uh, it's, it's an easier weed to control. I have more options of control with that one than other weeds. So it's talking about spotted knapweed or, or Canadian thistle. So, you know, it's a weed, it's there. Yeah, okay. Um, and it's benefiting me, but I would still be doing some kind of control measures of trying to change that disturbed site maybe a little faster and get it over to the desired species and trying to cultivate desired species in that area. Uh, I might not fret personally. It depends on the situation, but I might not fret near as much about, I got to get every Russian thistle out of that patch, right? Uh, but hopefully I'm making progress and transitioning that site quicker to the desired species and controlling the spread of that tumbleweed. I, I agree. Yeah, I agree, Jeremiah. I have an area where it was a uh, dirt, dirt roadway and um, uh, of course, Russian thistles came in and filled in that area, but I've also overseeded with grass to try to get it to get the grass to displace the other weeds. I don't treat it, I'll mow it. That way they won't roll away on me. Um, so, you know, it, it's other options to try to keep it and still stabilize the soil and keep things from blowing. Seems like it's also always a calculation between benefits and that you can get and the problems it might create. So, like you're talking about, Jenna, you suggested they seed and try and get it back to the state faster that Jeremiah was talking about. 
which seems like a good idea. And it also depends what's going on around it, right? So if it's a giant area with a lot of Russian thistle already there, you may not be affecting stuff quite as much as if it's a new patch that's starting, so that letting it go may cause you a lot of problems down the road. Yeah. I agree. Great question, though. All right, so what's yeah. next, Jenna? So <clears throat> I said identification is the most important, and um, I'm going to say that with a caveat in the economist in me and say, you know, the second most important would be calibration. And so especially if you're going with an herbicide route. And <clears throat> My caution to people when they come into the office is, you know, it's easy and they say, oh, well, you know, this product only costs $6.52 and I'm like, but there are some unintended costs <laughs> and opportunity costs of not calibrating. And so I don't know if you can kind of see in this image here, there's a, there's a line of, you know, where you can clearly see that the boom started and kind of where it ended and the length there and then the width. And so <clears throat> this four wheeler was calibrated to drive at four miles an hour. And we are guessing that this application happened at about two miles an hour. So Jenna. And this, yeah, so this is a, a small difference, seemingly small difference. Um, but you know, if you, if you made this error on an entire field or an entire pasture or in your entire lawn, you would have some unintended consequences and cost of not calibrating. And so for the cost of the, your time to calibrate, you don't need special equipment, you don't need fancy gadgets, you can by all means use them uh, to assist you, um, but <clears throat> you don't really need them. And so the cost of not calibrating can be higher. And so I just you know, I always caution people, do you want to find out what that cost is um, for, you know, for a few minutes of your time? Sure. Hold on, Jenna. So what, what is calibration? Okay. So calibration is not adjusting nozzles and buying new pressure gauges and getting new spray tips or buying a new sprayer. All calibration is telling us is we are using the same language for our sprayer that we are for an herbicide. Or if I want to talk to somebody, um, you know, in Idaho, hey ma'am, <clears throat> about her sprayer, it'll be the same as my sprayer. And that is typically in gallons per acre. And so all calibration is really doing is telling us what the output of our sprayer is. We're trying and to so, quantify how much we're applying, correct? Yeah. yeah. And so I really try and, I try and make it not sound scary. Like all it is, is the output, but it can, you know, it, <clears throat> it can influence so much more, but I want to kind of make it seem, it is very simple to do so people do it. So then they can answer these other questions a little bit better about, you know, how much do I put in my tank? Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and so that's what drives that answer. We, we can calibrate any type of application equipment, whether it's a one yeah. gallon single nozzle hand pump sprayer, a backpack sprayer with the same type of setup or a multiple nozzle sprayer. And everyone who applies pesticides needs to calibrate for themselves. They can't calibrate it for themselves and then give it to somebody else because we all walk at different yeah. speeds, those types of things. Right. Well, so I will say it really depends on what what type of weeds you're trying to control, right? And so uh, I'm gonna maybe uh, throw interject a little bit there, Jenna. Of I agree with you. Yeah, we first need to identify our weeds. Where are they? And quantify how big they are. And, and we need to understand that our next step is what are we gonna control, right? How are we gonna control that weed? And then look at calibration and our, and our options after we select it. Because if I'm not going to um, use chemical for my control measures. I don't need to calibrate my sprayer, right? I need to calibrate my sprayer right before I'm going to use that sprayer. Yeah, there are some other control methods though that need calibration as well, not just sprayers. And so we've talked about weed control, um, but a, 
you know, people deal with pests and things like that. So if you're using, for example, a burrow builder and you're trying to poison pocket gophers, and your machine is only in the top inch of soil instead of three inches, you know. So knowing familiarity with your equipment and um, applying that is very important. So I say calibrate, especially like, you know, we talk about herbicides a lot um, because it seems like it's easy, but I do want people to know that it isn't, it isn't just go mix some stuff or not mix some stuff and just go with straight product. And, um, but, you know, not to be intimidated by it. There are a lot of, uh, resources to help to help you calibrate and I I only listed one website on the bottom because we do have the the three main ones you know a backpack a multi nozzle boom and then the the boomless nozzles that you can also buy on a sprayer to farm and ranch supply store so Jeff I did like your comment you know you can calibrate anything so we uh, had an employee actually her sprayer was up in the shop and she didn't want to go get it and she had an empty um, you know, spray bottle that you might have like bleach or something. And so she cleaned it out really well and calibrated her little spray bottle. Sure. <laughs> then we also had somebody bring in actually a um, a pressure washer. <laughs> so if if anybody on the call here is very familiar with calibration rates, it was putting out 700 gallons per acre. But calibrated it and used it because that's what he had, and you know. Kudos for wanting to calibrate it and knowing that that needed to happen. So we can definitely do it, even if it seems unusual, yeah. So what about uh, spring weed control in something like our flower beds, garden space, something like that where we have a lot of desirable plants that are susceptible to herbicides and things like that. So we have a comment in our, in our chat box from Anita. Uh, the common weeds that grow in my flower beds and garden are mustards, thistles, and kochia. So what, what do we think of weed control in those types of settings? So <clears throat> this will go back to also calibration because mustard and thistle and kochia, when they're small, can be controlled um, by herbicide at much lower rates, say, than when they're a lot larger. So you'll need to know your calibration rate and then, again, the label, which Weed and Pest Control District, UW Extension, can help you with. Um, they do make, you know, a variety of products. So when we talk about herbicides or pesticides, we think a backpack sprayer or a hand sprayer and a liquid formulation. So there are some products, actually, that look like a little deodorant stick and you can, you know, kind of wipe that product directly on those leaves and that might be an option for something in a flower bed um, obviously <clears throat> ground cover you know so competing what what else is competing with that weed you need to look at irrigation if you're watering the entire flower bed versus just right directly at your desirable plant that can help with some of that unfortunately we can't control the rain all the time you know just half the time so you know you'll still get weeds kind of sprout up where you don't want them so I don't know if that really answered your question, Nita. You can sure keep typing if I haven't hit there yet. But mustard, uh, thistle, and kochia are best controlled definitely in the spring. You'll see second flushes of a lot of those different mustard species. Um, kochia can germinate throughout the season. You don't want to spray it when it's really little. It has pretty fine hairs on it that can impact your um, efficacy with herbicide. So you'll need to use a surfactant or a some type of uh, adjuvant in that system if you're spraying it when it's little, you know, but you don't want to wait till it's maybe past four inches. And again, depending on the thistle, uh, if it's a perennial like Canada thistle or if it's musk or scotch thistle, things like that, you can use with 2,4-D dicamba. We'll get those three species you listed specifically. So Jenna and flower beds, a lot of things that, uh, well, so there, there's different application timing, right? You can, a lot of what you're talking about is applying after the weeds have germinated. In, in flower beds, there are products that you can put out that are pre-emergent. So uh, you have yeah. to put them out, you have to put them out early before the seeds germinate. And when the seeds germinate, they'll come in contact with that treated area or the, the chemical, and then that will kill the seed and you won't have such issues in your flower beds. So. Uh, I, yeah. I, rely, I rely on pre-emergence a lot in my flower beds. So, yeah. uh, good point, yeah. This is Jenny. Um, 
in my flower beds, I find that mulch makes a world of difference. If I have enough mulch on there, it'll suppress the weeds about a thousand percent of the areas where I do not have any mulch. So then the challenge in Wyoming is keeping the mulch in place. So choosing your type of mulch that kind of knits together and having a thick layer on it really helps with those. And then generally, I will um, go through and pull out the ones that are easy to pull in the spring. I make sure it's my flower beds are watered before I do that. They're a lot easier to pull when it's watered. I'll pull out the little ones and then I know some of them it's like a lost cause because they're perennials as Jenna was talking about have really good root systems and they will be back. And so for those ones I use Roundup and she was talking about having the ones with the little applicator. So I will use rubber gloves and I'll get a little artist brush, you know, paint brush out of a kid's set and I use that and I keep it stored away where it's safe and I just use that to apply a little bit of Roundup on the ones I want to kill because usually I'm trying to kill weeds that are growing amongst plants I really don't want to kill and the ground up will kill whatever it touches it should be your presumption so that's so one approach any product containing glyphosate right Jenny yep <laughs> okay yeah it doesn't have to be roundup sorry it wasn't so, promoting roundup glyphosate and, works <laughs> and uh, to back to your point uh, I definitely agree with the mulching and uh, the the wind blows a lot where we live. The mulch that we use, it's a shredded pine product, and it it's uh, it knits together. And uh, we had some pretty significant uh, wind here recently, and fortunately, it all stays stays where it needs to. It doesn't blow away like a lot of the uh, pine bark mulches, those lighter weight mulches. Um, so it we utilize that a lot for weed control around our property. I guess for me, like with our flower beds, uh, we use a lot of, uh, so our first thing is hand pulling. We try and yep. reduce the amount of population of the weeds in there. So I'm dealing with a lot of annual weeds. So lamb's quarter, purslane, um, kochia, things like that. And so we're pulling those by hand <laughs> and throwing those away. Um, if those plants haven't gone to seed, we will pull them and drop them where we pull them at and use it as mulch. Oh, and let those try and suffocate. And if you get, at least from my experience, if you can get on those weeds early in the spring and get them uprooted and don't let them go to seed, for the rest of the summer, I have very minimal weeds that I have to battle in that. Uh, we yeah. then use the flowers and we'll chop those flowers and use that uh, biomass at the end of the growing season as mulch for next year. And then our last resort is chemical. That, that's kind of our approach to it. So Jenna, yeah. we have another question that's come from Tanya. She wants to know, um, can herbicides for thistles contaminate well water? I'm sorry, can you repeat it, Jenny? Can herbicides? From er herbicides used for controlling thistles contaminate well water? It depends. <laughs> um, I would say, any herbicide that is used improperly will have unintended consequences and impacts. And some of that can be on groundwater. I will, it's probably not a secret that one of my pet peeves is people who buy ready to use products at the store, which they're designed for people to, you know, take it from the store, go home, you spray it on a couple weeds in your driveway and you didn't have to think about it and that's great. Um, they still have directions on those containers, on those labels, you know, if one squirt will kill it, do you need four? Um, and so there was a study done that said that a lot of uh, runoff of water is contaminated with herbicides and those, a lot of those come from residential areas rather than, you know, maybe large fields or whatnot. So <clears throat> if an herbicide is used improperly and against the label, yes, it can contaminate groundwater. And so that's on everybody, no matter what scale, to ensure that you're using the correct product and you're using it on the correct site and that you're using it at the right time of year and the right time of day and at the right output, right? So you need to calibrate your sprayer so you know how much, if you put in too much, it's gonna leach the soil, things like that. So the short answer is yes, the long answer is know if you are you know using these chemicals properly the other I thing, the other I, remember, thing I sorry jeremiah all pesticides 
can do this. Yeah. Herbicides are pesticides. Yeah. All pesticides can impact groundwater and surface water in, uh, if they're used yeah. improperly. Right. And the other thing yeah. I would just uh, add to that is read the label. There are certain, yeah. uh, certain pesticides, but in this case, particular herbicides that would be used for control of thistle that uh, should not be sprayed near live water, be sprayed near a well, you need to keep a certain distance and that's going to be in the label of that, that herbicide. And, and I always tell uh, when I do instruction on uh, pesticide education, we always talk about the label and it's not the front cover, it's not the first two pages, it's the entire booklet and yeah. every material that comes with that, uh, comes with that product. And so read that to find that information out for you. You may have to get your reading glasses or a magnifying lens out to read it, but you do have to read that entire label. Right. So yeah, Jeff, so a, a tip for that would be um, to search for that label source online. My caution again would be to make sure that the EPA product registration number matches because there are different, you know, you might have a Roundup Power Max or Roundup Quick Pro, you know, so there's a lot of different names. So make sure that the products you're comparing are the same. Um, but typically, if you download that PDF off the internet onto your computer, you can hit Control F or go into a PDF and do, you know, edit or I think it's file and then do search. And you can search for water, well, surface, groundwater, things like that that you want to know. Or say I want to control scotch thistle, you can search scotch and see if it's listed on that label. Um, it saves a little bit of, I mean, I do it all the time because I don't have good enough eyeballs or uh, good enough time management, I guess, to read every label every single time somebody comes in. So if they have a specific question, I have that label downloaded, I can search for that specifically. But again, make sure that EPA product registration number matches. Yeah. Well, you kind of touched on it, Jenna, and I think this uh, question kind of prompts it. So what it is maybe some of the best control for Canadian, or not Canadian, but just thistles? What should I be considering for control of thistles? <clears throat> it depends. <laughs> okay, so um, walk us through the depends. That, <laughs> yeah, so <clears throat> some of it will depend on your site location. If it's in a pasture, and you have mostly grass around it, you know, we like to add a little bit more than 2,4-D dicamba. That would be a, a general recommendation. Um, they control broadleaf weeds really well, which, must, which thistles are. <clears throat> if it's in your pasture and you need a little bit more residual, so for example, I went out and sprayed a pasture a week and a half ago and got every thistle that was emerged. But I came back after it rained a little bit. It was nice and warm, 88 degrees apparently. <laughs> and, um, you know, there were new ones that emerged. And so if time isn't an issue and you can go back to the same site over and over and over again and then spray that with something like, say, glyphosate that doesn't have any activity in the soil, um, you can by all means do that. If you need something that gives you a little bit more protection in the soil against those newly emerging thistle, um, you need to consider something that has a little bit more soil activity. So what we use a lot here, this is just specific to Goshen County Weed and Pest, we use a lot of milestones and a lot of open site um, for thistles in pastures specifically, for musk and scotch. If we're talking about uh, Canada thistle, we need something that's more active in the roots. And so we look at a lot of transline, which is clopyrrolid or you know even tordon which is piclorum i know a lot of people have an aversion to that but it has it it has its place <laughs> in the system um typically you won't see those thistle in your lawn um you might kind of out like in some right aways or you know driveways around your buildings and sheds and stuff so if you get them early you can use a little bit i want um different products you know when it's smaller and if you wait until it bolts and not thistles over your head, you might as well just go whack off all the tops and collect all that seed because you're just going to be fighting a, a very steep uphill battle if you're waiting until that point to spray them with herbicide. 
When is the best time to control thistle? So <clears throat> this is a canned answer I give everyone whenever you can, because any, some form of control is better than no control. There is a best time, and that would be in the spring, like now, when they're still rosette, or in the fall, when they have newly germinated, but they're still rosette. So like I said, after they bolt, and these what are for biennial thistles. Example of a rosette, not of a thistle plant. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Jeff's coming through with all the pictures, thank you. <laughs> um, so I, I will say, as a plug for our website, we do have thistle guides there specifically, and like I've mentioned before, Canada thistle is not one that you want to, you know, dig up with a shovel. Um, musk and scotch, you need to, if you're going to dig up with a shovel, you need to get two to four inches below ground um, to really make sure that growing point is out of there and not, and not coming back on you. So <clears throat> the best time is, uh, like I said, in the spring and fall, if you're talking about musk and scotch, uh, Fall is probably the best time for Canada thistle. It's moving all those carbohydrates down into, you know, it's excess energy down into the bottom of the plant so you get a little bit better root activity. Um, I say musk and scotch because that's what we have over here. There are other thistles uh, in the eastern part of the state. I'm not trying to ignore you, <laughs> like plumeless thistle or, <clears throat> you know, some counties have bull thistle listed and we get a lot of people that come in and say, I have bull thistle. It's not that common in Goshen County. Uh, so again, identification is important because some of those products work really good on, say, musk in Canada, but they don't work on scotch, or they work on Canada, but not musk or scotch. So identification is important, um, but yeah, any control is better than no control. <laughs> okay, so I've heard that, uh, like Canadian thistle in particular, it's better to do um, a herbicide control for Canadian thistle in the fall. Would you, do you agree with that? Is that a question? Yeah, or? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, just, well, that's just what I've heard. So is that the best time to control Canadian thistle? Is it, do I need to wait until then? Do, or sh am I wasting my effort and my time by spraying in the spring for Canadian thistle or in the growing season? Um, just thoughts. I would not say, I wouldn't say any, uh, I wouldn't say any control is wasted. Um, because even, if, I'll go back to the bolted musk and scotch that's already 10 feet tall. At least you're out there, you know where it's at. Um, your herbicide might not do, depending on the herbicide, might not do much for the thistle that's already there. But if you get some on the soil, you could, you know, prevent some germination. Canada thistle specifically, spring and fall is a great time. If summer is the only time you can get out there and spray it, you know, if it's July 15th or August 1st, and that's the only time you can spray it because maybe you have other vegetation around or you have other, you know, time restrictions or site restrictions, you know, some of that can be in a really kind of water infiltrated place. And so you might not be able to get in there until it's dry. I would say none of that's wasted. You just need to be a little more selective with your control choice. Um, so you might not want to mow Canada thistle in July 1st or, you know, spread that seed around a little bit more because it still can spread by seed, not just by root. So any time is fine. You just need to alter your control methods based on what time you are. Gotcha. So Jenna, Great. with some of those perennial weeds that folks say, you know, fall can be really an effective time for controlling them. Why is that? So similar to what I said with Canada thistle, it, it's moving a lot of those carbohydrates down into the roots. And so most herbicides that we use are translocated. And so when you see all those droplets, you know, touch, hit the plant, it's then moving that herbicide either through the xylem or the phloem, kind of up the plant or down the plant, again, depending on the herbicide. And so <clears throat> with a perennial, we really want to impact those roots reserves, the, the energy reserves in the root. And so in the fall, they're typically removing those energy reserves to the root. So they want all those energy reserves underground so they don't freeze, right? Because you typically the above ground will die. And so they're kind of moving all of that down underground for winter storage. And so when they move all those energy reserves, they're also moving that herbicide into the soil, into the root. 
um, versus in the summer or spring, you know, maybe when they're actively growing and they're trying to get that herbicide or they're trying to get their growth and energy up to the top, that's where they're moving the herbicide and that might not be as effective long term. Um, but like I said, it will still impact them, just maybe not as much. So Does we that have a. Answer? I think that was good. Yeah, thanks, Jenna. Um, so we have a question in the chat box. Uh, is there a good grass garden control? Uh, Donna brings this to us. Sorry. So controlling grass plants that are growing in gardens among broadleaf type plants, I think is what And probably some plants that are susceptible, to. right? Susceptible yeah. to herbicides. Yeah, so <clears throat> it'll depend on the type of grass. Yeah, if it's an annual or a perennial, right? So if it's yeah. cheat grass, that's yeah. an annual, right? Or is it Kentucky bluegrass that's moving from your lawn and encroaching into the garden space, which is a perennial? So cheat grass is easy to pull, so that makes it a little easier. It has a weak little root system. But what about the perennial grasses, like the Kentucky bluegrasses that are crawling into your garden? Yeah, how about that, Jeff? <laughs> well, I would, so I, I actually have that issue, um, but it's not intermixed amongst the other plantings. So I can go in and selectively split, selectively apply a glyphosate product on the grass uh, to control that. Um, and I'm not hitting any of the desirable plants that I want. Um, the, the other thing too, uh, if it's an annual grass, it's uh, pre-emergent products will eliminate a lot of that uh, stuff. Um, and then mulching as well. But um, there are some grass specific products out there. And Jenna, I don't know if you're as familiar with them or not, but um, their, their last, their, their scientific names on the product, it either ends with FOP or DIM. So, um, you have to look at the active ingredient on the product name and and if it says something big long word and ends in fop or big long word and ends in with dim it's usually a grass specific product and you can apply it in amongst your broadleaf weeds or excuse me your broadleaf desirable plants and not affect them and but uh, those products you really have to make sure that you read the label because grasses are notorious for um, repelling herbicides. So uh, it's really important to take a look at the label and understand how to apply them and when to apply them. And the physical well, controls, yeah. the parts of putting in a right. border along your garden to keep your, your lawn grasses from crawling in is super important. So I'm always super picky about the type of edging I use along my gardens to keep them out. So, so Jenny, I, I did some of that this last year. Um, and I have grass coming underneath the border and it's a four inch steel border. <laughs> yes, so I get the deepest one I can possibly get. Yeah. I had so to go online and it was like a six inch. It's, uh, it's a foot and a half deep yeah. and we're, getting, we're keeping grass out. <laughs> yeah, so I, it drives me crazy to have to pull the same grass plant over and over and over again. Right, yeah. Well, life. and I think this is a situation, I mean, we've, we've already talked about it in other shows of, of tillage, right? that if, if tillage is done too much, it is bad. But this is a, in a springtime, in a garden situation where you're growing annual plants, uh, annual vegetable plants, tillage can be of use. And that rototiller could help in terms of keeping at bay some of these perennial plants. However, you don't want to rototill too much. You don't want too much tillage to where you are being detrimental to your soil and to your organic matter that you are trying to build in that, that garden space. But that's another control method that can help. And trying to do that ahead of time before you plant into that field. Uh, I don't think I see it as much in garden spaces, uh, but in agriculture fields, right? They do a, what they call a pre-plant burn down. And so they'll use a herbicide that's a non-selective herbicide, so it'll kill both grasses and broadleaves. They'll spray that field down and then plant after they've sprayed. So they're trying to, and in some cases, they'll even water that field to encourage the weeds to come up and flush, spray them, 
then come back in and plant. And they're just trying to reduce that population. Again, I haven't seen that as much in gardens. Oh, I when I talk to folks about doing landscape beds, new landscape beds, the major emphasis is on weed control before you get started because it'll save you years and years of trouble, as yeah. Jenna knows, and try and control, especially yeah. those <laughs> perennial nasty ones that come back and you're trying to kill them off now between plants you want to live is much more complicated. So if you spend like a season, a whole season trying to get rid of your weeds before you create a new landscape bed, you'll be ahead of the game. One of the best uh, tools that I have incorporated in my gardening experience is uh, what we call a stirrup hoe. And if you're not familiar with it, 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 you, it, it it's also called a, a scuffle hoe or a shuffle hoe, but it has a, a loop and you just place it on top of the soil and then you're just cutting the weeds off maybe a quarter of an inch below the soil surface. And then that is enough to kill that weed and it, it's a very efficient, that and hand pulling, we do a lot of that. Yep. It's tough to get away from hand pulling in a garden setting in particular, but yeah. so to kind of wrap up our show here in that, if there's other questions, please let us know. Uh, but Jenna, I just got, one more question for you. One area we have not talked about, right? And I don't think it, it doesn't have really a good answer, but how do we control weeds in an area with like desired plants? So a grass weed in a grass field or broadleaf weeds in a broadleaf uh, crop, if you will, it may be in a garden or in a, uh, in a field. He's giving so, you all the tough ones. Yeah, yeah. nice of him. Yeah. Well, we were expecting and you to say it, it depends, be... Jenna. <laughs> I won't say it, I promise. <clears throat> there are options. I think at that point, and what we kind of haven't, we've been dancing around it a little bit, but weeds are always a symptom of a problem, right? And so we've talked about disturbed sites or in your flower garden. And so one thing that we're talking about is either bringing in weed seeds from somewhere else, if we use compost or, you know, things like that. And if we went down by the river and had a nice walk with our dogs and now we have cheat grass in our lawn, you know, so did you move those weed seeds from somewhere else? And so it's a symptom of, weeds are a symptom of something, um, whether that be mother nature and wind just did it uh, or, <clears throat> you know, maybe your neighbor brought them in or whatnot. So it's a symptom of something. And so prevention is important when we're talking about controlling uh, weeds of, that are like a desirable species. So that's why we try and control the spread as much as possible. Um, so prevention is important. Eradication is not likely. Um, and you also might have to come to terms with the fact that your desirable plant might not be great competitors in that environment and so maybe you should kind of reframe what your desirable plant species should be or could be for that environment um so we you know as humans in general just try and control all of that and sometimes mother nature mother nature doesn't let us and so you're gonna have to you know maybe work with her a little bit better <laughs> right Oh, I agree. I yeah. probably couldn't have said it much better. But I think in those situations where we have a weed that is very similar to our, our desired plant species, those are just difficult situations to control once they're established. Um, and it really gets back to, I think, what you've hit on through the whole session is identify it. We got to be able to identify it first. And you may get to a point in certain situations where you might have to just sacrifice. You might have to sacrifice that area or that crop or that, that desired planting to get the weed under control if it's a big enough issue to start again. So, yeah, I will. I know I had a couple more slides, but I'll just pick one point out of maybe two. Sure. Um, always, always wear PPE, <laughs> always wear proper PPE, no latex gloves. If you're going out to spray one plant with herbicide, you know, oh, I don't need gloves or I don't, I'm going to just leave my flip-flops on because I don't want to tie my shoes or, you know, always wear proper PPE. I don't want to get into lawsuits and stuff, but <clears throat> proper PPE, it's on the label for a reason. <laughs> okay. Uh, the second one I'll just say is beware of 
friendly formulations found on online resources. Facebook, social <laughs> <There> media. Are, <laughs> you know, I people just say in general, you know, maybe herbicides are bad. I don't want to use them. Well, the herbicides that are on the market have been researched. Uh, they they came to market through a long, tedious process, and they were allowed to be on the market versus some of these little homemade remedies or, you know, it's less toxic or it's more organic and, you know, don't, I'm not saying that some of them don't work, but do some diligence and put some research effort into that and always, always contact your extension professionals in your area or your weed and pest um, because, you know, some of those online forums are from Georgia and we live in Wyoming and they're very different and they might act on weeds different there than they do here in um, so we talked about groundwater, you know, so all those things are different based on that area. So again, extension, weed and pest, we have localized knowledge um, that we can help you. Great. I don't see any other questions. Do you have anything else, Jeff? I don't see any outstanding questions. Great. I think we're good. Uh, Jenny, you, did, do you have anything there on Facebook? going to take that as no. So, well, we well, want to wrap up the show. Thank you so much, Jenna, for joining us and, and helping us yeah. be educated and battle our weeds this spring. Uh, thank you for everybody that has joined us today. We really appreciate it. A couple things to wrap up. So, we talk about the Barnyards Backyards Live. Uh, we have more shows coming up. So, if you want to see that, uh, go to our Barnyards and Backyards website. Uh, Jenny is showing that here on the page now. The URL is up there in the top corner. Uh, if you want to know about future shows, but also shows like this one, we're recording them, uploading them to that website as well. So if you missed it or you want to watch it again or, or reference it to someone else, we have those available. Materials that we recommended in the shows as well, we're trying to put those up and post those so you have those. The, the next thing that we have is uh, for our county offices, please reach out to us. Just like Jenna said, man, we got some vital resources in your local counties. Contact your local weed and pest uh, office. Talk to them specifically about their cost share programs. Certain uh, offices offer, offer different uh, options for you. So some have spray equipment that you can lease or rent. Uh, they have a seed that they sell. They have uh, uh, drills that you can use to plant your your uh, acreage to things like that. So they're a wealth of knowledge, great resources. They're there to serve you. Uh, also, contact your extension offices. So uh, we have a county office in every county of the state, 23, and then one on the Wind River Indian Reservation. So please contact your extension office and and help. Let us help you identify weeds. Let us help you understand maybe some options for control of that that pest or weed so get in touch with those folks the last the yeah last, you, you guys pay, you guys pay us so make us work for it right right we're here to help you um put your tax dollars to use right um yeah absolutely the last thing we have is uh, an evaluation so we want to hear back from you how we're doing with these barnyards and backyards live shows uh jenny has posted in the comments section uh a link for you to fee give us feedback on a quick survey. If you have time, please fill that out. For those of you that have joined us, we ha you will be prompted in an internet browser once you close this session. If you have time, please let us know. With that, happy Friday. Have a great weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thank you.